you're creative. Yes, there's lots of creative people in the world. But to build a trust-based relationship with someone that can push you way out of your comfort zone, that's quite special. Business of Architecture, episode 388. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week, I'm speaking with the co-founder of Studio Banana, Key Kawamura. Studio Banana founders Key Kawamura and Ali Ganjavian met and became fast friends whilst attending the University of East London whilst doing their architecture degrees. They felt they weren't quite fitting into the places they were working at and they decided to start their own architecture and product design firm, Studio Banana, in 2007. They further expanded into a wide breadth of creative projects, developing a rich repertoire of entrepreneurial projects in the fields of transdisciplinary creativity, communication, design-led innovation and education. Studio Banana, they're actually responsible for the globally acclaimed ostrich pillow, which you should Google and check out because it's wonderful. And they've been involved in high yield, high impact, innovative projects for clients such as the United Nations, Nestle, Coca-Cola, Al Jazeera, Ernest & Young, the Qatar Foundation, McCann Erickson, Santander Bank, Vodafone and Telefonica, among many others. So in 2019, they published a book, Work Out of the Box, a collection of conversations with industry leaders and case studies from their portfolio to break design-driven transformation down into 13 core principles as a sort of manifesto on how to design work environments and work cultures. In this episode, Key offers up a great vantage point into the philosophy of Studio Banana, the company culture, their business strategy, and deployment methodology. And we also explore the perceived dichotomy between business and creativity and how an understanding of the constraints and the tension between the two produces an environment where innovation can flourish. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Key Kawamura. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Key, welcome to the business of architecture. How are you? Thank you, Ryan. Very, very well. And you? I'm very good. Thank you. So you are the co-founder of Studio Banana. um, And you've also written the book, Think Work Out of the Box. And your design practice is hugely innovative. You guys have got your fingers in many different pies in the design world and you're engaging in lots of different interesting uh, projects. I suppose my first question is, how would you describe Studio Banana? It's always hard to describe uh, something that's so close to to your heart. Mm. But um, to make things simple, we are a design studio focused Mm -hmm. on design driven transformation. So we like working with organizations that uh, are in a process of change, transformation, and we believe that design is a tool for that. Got it. I would be. This, I would describe ourselves that simply. <laughs> so, 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 what kind of engagements do you run with clients? What sorts of projects, or how do they, how do they begin working with you? Transformation can take uh, many shades and, and forms, as you can imagine. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, what we like is clients uh, normally organizations, companies, mm-hmm. or, or, or other but organizations that come to us with complex problems. And we love problems uh, because that's, that's a source of inspiration for us. Mm-hmm. That's, uh, you know, in already in identifying well the problem and asking very smart questions together with clients, users, we have half of the solution uh, in front of us. And we like the labyrinth, you know, trying to find the answers to these wicked uh, questions. So what we ask our, quest- our clients is to come to us with, uh, with issues, not already with uh, preconceived solutions for which they just want you know, uh, an execution. Yeah. We, love, we love riddles. How, how did the business begin? My partner, my co-founding partner, Ali and myself, we met, uh, we met in university 
uh, first day of university, we became friends. Uh, we were so different. We kind of uh, felt uh, you know, love at first sight. <laughs> Someone who's so different to you, you are either repulsed or attracted. Yeah. To. And um, in this case, I think we felt that we were very complementary to each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, somehow I think that uh, the business began then already we had we went through a similar form uh, education and those were very formative years to us in london we studied we had the luck of going through uh, you know really um, mind opening uh, teachers and tutors and mentors but where were you studying uh, at, the, at the ra we studied together at the university of east london okay which, um, which was a, an amazing vibrant uh, um, location full of uh, creative uh, minds and uh, misfits yeah <laughs> lots of misfits <laughs> <laughs> um, and that you know that's a recipe for for great things to happen when you fit when you put all these um misfits together and um yeah afterwards uh, ali went to the rca mm -hmm. and i went to the aa to the architectural association okay. And, uh, you know, afterwards, we, we each took uh, our paths. Uh, Ali went to, to New York. I went to work uh, with Herzog and Demeron for several years. But there was something that was already planted within us from those formative years that mm -hmm. kind of was deeply embedded in our DNA by then. And we felt uh, we couldn't conform to these places where we were working. And, you know, believe me, House of Demo is an amazing place to work at. And you get exposed to all sorts of yeah. amazing opportunities and projects and clients and, and learnings. But deep inside, I knew I wanted to do something else together with Ali. So at the beginning, we, you know, it, the start of the project, came, of, the, of the studio, is the result of this um, insurgency, if you want. We were insurgents. There was something that we didn't feel uh, existed in the world mm -hmm. and that it was approaching the first of all using design as a tool and secondly i think a key thing that was for us important is a sense of community and a very diverse community another community made of uh, similar minded people or of people with similar skill sets yeah but uh, designers from different trades creative people from different uh, backgrounds brought together so again to recreate that environment of misfits that i was referring yes. to earlier yeah that was the beginning and uh well the little anecdote is that uh we we opened our first space in on banana street mm -hmm. and we took the name of the street <laughs> love it love it so the the sort of work that you're doing now obviously stretches into lots of different disciplines and, and territories what were the first projects that you had in the office because it's a different kind of proposition and I think there's lots of our listeners would be keen to know well I'd love to have a, a, a business like this because it's kind of you know you, you're with it, it, it looks like you're without boundaries right you're kind of you're able to occupy these different territories and it's it's a kind of a niche in itself which is the niche with no niche in a way <laughs> So how, what, what, were the, what were those first projects and how did you, how did you win them? Hmm. Let me tell you a little story. The day we, we were moving into our new space at Banana Street, mm -hmm. uh, same day, all over the news, all over the world, there was the Lehman Brothers crash. With ah. all, these, all these people leaving with boxes you know, <laughs> in Manhattan. It was like this reverse moment and we were seen watching that on the news while we were moving into our space and we were wondering hmm have we chosen the wrong moment you know that that was the beginning of the whole 2008 uh, credit crunch and global financial collapse and i think uh, most of uh, you know what happened yeah it was tough what what came after after that so we that kind of pushed us to be extremely inventive about how to do business mm. because there was, I mean, COVID has been uh, you know, a terrible thing what's happened in the last year. We can all agree to that. Um, but back then there was a sentiment of pessimism of uh, we've been betrayed by the financial institutions. Lots of people lost uh, jobs, no, no credit, there was really a sense of injustice, pessimism, of fear of we, you know, 
we will never be able to trust each other again. And that sense of that moment of reckoning mm -hmm. for us was eye opening. We said, okay, we will probably need to do business differently. Yeah. There's not such thing as business as usual anymore. Um, and uh, it was not a surprise that it was very hard for us to find clients. So I think that uh, it's fair to say that, uh, mm, you know, we, we did a lot of learning and education. Um, so that helped us, you know, make the ends meet, if you want. Mm -hmm. Also be in touch with, uh, with students. That was extremely uh, motivational for us to be with uh, people in school who still think, you know, we can we can change the world and we can so that was very very cool and um and then we started to realize well if people don't come to us with projects then we will need to invent projects because we can't just stay here cross-armed waiting for the telephone to ring because yeah. it's not gonna ring so a lot of projects from that period were self-initiated right we for instance we created the first co-working space in madrid that's where you know Banana Street I was referring to is, was in Madrid. Mm -hmm. um, we created the first co-working space uh, in Madrid, in Spain, as a matter of fact. And one of the first, I would say, in Europe, because back in 2007, co-working was sort of unheard of. Mm -hmm. And you know that was very much in line with that spirit of let's bring a community of people from different, you know, uh, train trades and uh, and. Uh, and capabilities and we'll figure out afterwards what magic we can do together but we need to bring first people brains ideas together and mm -hmm. intelligent you know talent density um so that was a self-initiated project of course with lots of risks but in that period somehow the crisis was a blessing blessing for us mm. because um there was uh, an understanding that together we're stronger and yeah. that sharing <laughs> We can be more resilient. So we attracted a lot of attention as a result of that. Um, somehow as a, that led to a lot of spin-offs. One of them was, this was the very, very beginning of, um, of streaming of YouTube. YouTube, I think, was created in 2004. Yeah, um, something around that, 2004, Yeah, we we're in 2007, 8, and we are there full of ideas and no full of energy as well, and no clients. So what do we do? Well, we see around what possibilities are there. And when we see this thing that's booming called YouTube, where people are posting silly videos of their kid high on anesthetics. And <laughs> <laughs> you remember those videos, those early YouTube videos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we were like, wait a second. This is an amazing opportunity to stream content, high quality curated content about the fields we, we care about and that... Um, and that suddenly we have a global audience uh, at our disposal. So we, we created an online TV channel using uh, the you know the nascent technology of uh, of YouTube. And again, we had time, energy, ideas. So we started curating content on YouTube. Created created this uh, virtual uh, TV, um, and it was an extreme success in terms of uh, audience. But again, it was difficult to monetize that. So another another self-initiated project. Mm -hmm. And I would say the third one, and this one was really, um, I would say, a pivotal moment in our, in our history was the, the ostrich pillow, was this product that we created, which was an absolute joke at the beginning. Because um, I used to, you know, I'm being, being half Japanese, I like taking my, my naps anywhere and everywhere, <laughs> even standing up. <laughs> So the desk at the studio was this amazing surface waiting for me to sleep. So mm. I did that regularly after lunch, but it was very uncomfortable. Mm. And uh, I'm half as a joke, half as an, really an exploration. We designed this product to sleep better and power naps. Yeah. With, which we naively tried to sell to design companies and uh, linen manufacturers and pillow manufacturers and everyone was giving us that look like hey are you guys no yeah high on something <laughs> and again we combined that with an opportunity that was the the early days of crowds uh crowdfunding mm. 
I think it was year one or year two of uh, of Kickstarter. Right. And we said, hey, again, an opportunity here, like YouTube, uh, an opportunity. Let's go for it. We went for it, and well, the rest is history. We've been running this company, Ostrich Pillow, this brand. We're coming up with new products for the last now 13, 14 almost years. And, uh, Amazing. How, yeah. how was that, That's really interesting because I, I remember, you know, when I first saw that Ostrich Pillow idea and it was, was it featured in Design and kind of it had, it had, it had a certain amount of virality, didn't it? Where it was just being shared everywhere and it was, it was interesting, it was witty, it was funny, it was bizarre. And it really kind of captured people's imaginations. And so from, from that, what, what other products have you ended up developing? The ostrich pillow was, you know, it started, as I said, a little bit like a joke, but actually we realized it's <laughs> the world lacks sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, seriously, lacks sleep. Um, so we, we found a niche there, uh, selling sleep. Some people do it with uh, five-star hotels. We do it with a, a product that costs much, much less, and it's portable. Uh, so we started developing a whole family of uh, napping products. Then we started expanding that, that notion of napping into uh, travel, uh, traveling comfortably. Yeah. And, um, and then a couple of years ago, before, before the pandemic and before the whole travel industry went, uh, you know, um, silent for a while we started repositioning this we realized that it's not about enabling people's uh, fast-paced lifestyle it, mm -hmm. it's it's no we should, we have a responsibility when we are product designers we are somehow nudging behaviors and we we realized that the world's taking a speed that is starting to be pretty unhealthy yeah we started to focus on the well-being uh, and self-care space and we started yeah this repositioning exercise so our new products are much more focused on this self-care introspective uh, slow down uh, ethos mm. uh, which is absolutely compatible with sleeping when you can and when you can to catch up so uh, so mm. Tell me, tell me a little bit, but so is Ostrich Pillow now its own separate entity as a company? And is that, mm -hmm. it, how is it structured? Is it something that's owned by Studio Banana? Mm -hmm. And then do you have a, its own team who are kind of mm -hmm. now running it and developing new products all the time? Yes. It's part of our entrepreneurial um, story, I guess. I love it. We, you know, I, I like saying that I'm an architect by training by education and an uh, entrepreneur by miseducation. <laughs> Somehow I, I ended up, uh, we ended up, uh, Ali, myself, and we have two more partners. We ended up being entrepreneurs, but we didn't study for that. We somehow yeah. had the spirit, I guess, had the ambition and, um, and the drive for it, but uh, we don't have the formal education, training, all the, you know, all the right things to do and the do's and don'ts. Mm -hmm. We learned a lot by doing, learning by doing. And um, and one of these things is how do you manage a brand? I think a lot has been uh, observing other people and being very humble about your own brand and uh, seeing how it could be evolving and you know, learning from the best, benchmarking against other people. Mm -hmm. A lot also is through trial and error as well. And I guess with Ostrich Pillow, it was a little bit like this at the beginning. It was, uh, as I said, the, you know, it was the baby that gave uh, fame to, to the parents, if you want. Yeah. So Ostrich Pillow uh, became more famous, more viral, more known uh, and recognized than, than Studio Banana. And uh, we kept it sort of as a, you know, as a product of Studio Banana. But at some point it, um, bringing, keeping those two brands associated, it stopped making sense. We yes. realized we're talking with very different audiences. One company is B2B, the other one's B2C. One company is absolutely witty, whereas Studio Banana, we like keeping, you know, fun is a big component of, of our ethos. But we started, you know, when you're talking to a company saying, hey, share your wicked problem with us. I don't think that they'll be like happy to do that with someone who's 
telling jokes or you know being quirky about things so we started to realize well the tone of voice the target <clears throat> the methods are very different the business models are very different so we we took a decision which i think is absolutely the right one and at the right moment mm -hmm. to separate two brands also as companies uh, we are four partners um, one partner is a product designer he's absolutely focused 100 percent on ostrich pillow um and uh and now yes they, they live lives of of their own but uh well we you know yeah that, that that's their buddies, their buddies. That, that's really interesting because you know for many that's all and also quite difficult i can imagine in terms of having to make that decision because there might have been the, the choice of well do we just go 100 percent into ostrich pillow and that's all we do and are we going to be happy doing that and how to balance the sort of design sensibilities and curiosity that you have that that kind of creative partnership entails and how do you marry the two so actually it makes sense it makes it makes sense now, but I can imagine at the time, you know, that that would have been a, a kind of a, a conflict in many ways or difficult. It, it was. It was. It was a hard decision. It was a decision that we didn't take lightly. Mm -hmm. We we consulted uh, friends and people that knew us uh, from years, also customers. We consulted them, uh, toying with the idea. Ultimately, I think it was down to a very basic thing: you need to be passionate about what you do. Mm -hmm. With Ostrich Pillow, uh, there is a clearly a creative component to it. But there's also, you know, we are we're manufacturers, we are distributors, we are vendors. We, you know, we, we manage the whole life cycle <clears throat> of the product. And the creative part is one, one part of it, but there's a whole lot of it where you need to be uh, very diligent. Um, Otherwise, the you know the business can can go down the drain, and uh, and as designers, we didn't have the I think certainly the hard skills, but also the passion to do that you know to the best of our abilities, putting you know being full on. So we we realized we needed to surround ourselves with people who are better than us in doing those things, who are passionate about that, who will really live. Um, um, for for that mission yeah and um and to also the creative part we're still involved uh, the different partners um, but to acknowledge that it has its place in in that company um whereas in studio banana the the processes the speed uh, of uh, relationships the life cycle of projects is much faster pace you know, we're talking with clients and sometimes it uh, might be three, six, 12, 24 months, but there is, there is a, there's a beginning, there's a middle, there's an end, there's an evolution of the relationship. There's a constant creative challenge, sometimes more strategic, sometimes more, sometimes more tactical, sometimes more executional, but there's always a creative challenge there. Mm. And uh, we felt deeply passionate about that. And it would have been, it would not have been, um, fair on the full potential of ostrich pillow if we would have kind of hung on there and um, without letting these people who are much more uh, proficient yeah. do their job properly <laughs> yeah yeah really really fascinating and and so how what did that release in terms of you know focus for studio banana how did how did you then kind of evolve and what sorts of projects did you start engaging with we we identified several things in which we were unique, I suppose. Um, and one of them is is very intangible. It's, it has a lot to do with soft skills, with building trust. Mm. Building trust with clients is is a mag I think it's magic. It's art. I mean, there are there are ways of doing that, but. Um, we we heard from our own clients they echoed saying you know what was great with us is i mean you're creative yes there's lots of creative people in the world but to be to build a trust based relationship with someone that can push you way out of your comfort zone that's quite special right yeah and you were referring earlier to our innovative uh, approach i think that building that trust um is, is fundamental. So 
that's that's uh, somehow the uh, the DNA or the common factor to all our projects is building that trust, that common language. Uh, we do that a lot through co-design. Mm -hmm. We involve users. We involve uh, key stakeholders. We don't come as you know. Um, what's the word, um, authors, like, you know, uh, design authors coming doing the magical sketch and it has to be like this. Otherwise I would get very upset, Mr. or Mrs. Client. We, <clears throat> on the contrary, we, we come mainly with questions, not with answers. And this is something that we hear over and over and uh, it's still, <laughs> after so many years, it still surprises us because, well, it's the only way we can really do projects is yeah. by asking a lot of questions. And recently we, we had a debriefing with a, with a client and, uh, and a multi-stakeholder, a lot, you know, complex organization. And one of them said, what I, love, what I love the most about working with Studio Banana is that you, you didn't come with, and he wrote, exclamation marks. And that was probably what he expected from designers to come with, Loud, ma loud words and big statements and bold ideas and exclamation marks everywhere. He said, you didn't come with <clears throat> question marks, oh, wait, sorry, with exclamation marks. You came with, and he wrote question marks. And, uh, and that helped them realize that the problem, you know, that by asking a lot of questions around the problem that we were trying to solve, we were already exploring ideas and we were doing this together with yeah. them. And that builds a lot of trust, showing that vulnerability. We don't have the answers, at least not at the beginning. Yeah. Uh, we will find the answers with you and with you and with you and with your users and maybe even with your clients. We might involve your clients mm. in this process because ultimately they will probably benefit from the whole thing. Um, and... Uh, and I think that that's really what has defined our unique uh, approach. And then afterwards, what skill sets you put at the service of the project will, will be dictated by, by those early conversations. Do we need, uh, I don't know, a website? Do we need a building? Do we need a kinetic sculpture? Do we need a space, a digital tool? <laughs> we'll figure that out. Yeah. Brilliant. And um, uh I'm very interested in, do you still engage in self-initiated project, projects in terms of being able to do more research into certain fields or territories, or is it now solely you're working with clients? The, the very honest answer is not as much as we would love to. Right. So we still, we still have self-initiated projects. Um, one that was for us, uh, um, very dear was the this publication, this book you were referring to earlier, Work Out of the Box. Yep. It's, a, it's a manifesto around uh, how do you design work environments and work cultures. And it's it's very much in line with our attitude. It's, it's a series of conversations with other people. It's not about our view and our only view and you know, it's not a statement, it's a, it's a piece of conversation. It's a dialogue with many people that we put together about, you know, something we believe deeply in, but always in relationship with other people, with other experts, with people that know more than us on certain things. And at the end, you know, the truth, the right solution is somewhere in, in between in that dialogue, right? So that that's a project that... Uh, we self-initiated and it was um, uh, extremely successful people really I mean I can say it um, maybe with a little bit of modesty but <laughs> people love <laughs> love the book and um, and now we we are in the process of developing also new new initiatives that um, you know again like back in 2007 looking at YouTube 2008, nine, looking at uh, crowdfunding. We like keeping our antennas. What's the latest? What's the future? Mm. And, uh, you know, being a bit opportunistic, if you want, about, um, you know, some of the new uh, possibilities that, uh, that innovation offers and how we can 
with our design focus um, add another dimension to that. How, when you first started, it was it was you and your and your, and your partner Eli. Um, how many people now do you have in the office or in the studio? We are um, so our core team. We're fifty five people, I believe now. Yeah. Give or take. Uh, in four locations, yep. um, Madrid, uh, London, Basel, mm-hmm. and Lausanne, so two in Switzerland, one in the UK, one in Spain. Um, but, you know, with uh, what I said earlier, what we love is creating a community of yeah. people and, and also challenging ourselves with people that know more than us on certain things. So we like also opening uh, our projects to our network and... Um, you know, networking knowledge, basically, uh, involving people who are specialists, um, also friends with whom we have a, you know, a great time co-creating, involving them in, in our project. So that that network is wider. And it's right. Important. Okay. But, so yeah, our core team, we're, we're 55 people. And and how do you manage then to maintain, because when, you when you're getting into those, you know, the kind of 50 and above range, it's when it's starts to become there are a lot more new challenges if you like in terms of maintaining culture and management and leadership how do you manage to maintain such high levels of innovation as the team is growing somehow we you know we want to demystify uh innovation first of all there are many types of innovation Mm -hmm. and second innovation doesn't depend you know there's no magical formula there's there's a somehow a convergence of conditions mm-hmm. and typically you one person a company is responsible capable of managing, managing a certain number of those conditions but not all of them yep. um, in our case when we work with uh, in projects and if we want those projects to be to have an exploratory nature to be innovative we are highly 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 dependent on finding a partner call it client organization that is open-minded mm. that is willing to walk off the you know the the you know, into walk into the risk area into off their comfort zone together with us and that that's that's sort of uh, the first premise <laughs> for innovative projects you need you need innovative clients and you also need innovative clients that come with uh, with questions, right? As I said earlier, with problems, not with solutions. Because I mean, if they come with the solution, what innovation is there? You just yep. need to execute it. Um, then, of course, there's a, there's a part that concerns us, and we need to ensure is to keep the team um, always alert, always uh, at the edge of uh, of what's possible. You know, to always be exploring the art of the possible. Yeah. And that, I believe, is something that's innate to creative people, but you need to feed that, you know, fuel that fire (laughs) if you want. Um, You need talent, and we try, you know, uh, to the best of our ability to to hire talent and to feed this culture of talent density. Mm -hmm. Second, you need to have also space for that talent to deploy itself. Mm-hmm. And it's not certainly not through micromanagement. It's certainly not through uh, a pyramidal structure where all decisions or all key decisions need to be taken by Ali or Kay or Pablo or Alex or the partners. No, we need to delegate. People need to also um, feel safe. I think that's uh, uh, that has to do a lot with trust. I mentioned earlier when you build trust you can allow yourself certain mistakes, certain uh, failures along the way. And um, and if you don't try a little bit, you don't taste a failure, you, you know, chances are you're never going to invent much. Yeah. So feeding that culture, I think, from the position of leadership is fundamental to allow people to make mistakes, to uh, certainly not punish when something doesn't happen as planned, if there was a good intention there. I think that, uh, you know, if if the right attitude, the right ethos, the right values are in place, um, 
we we encourage people to to take risks. Mm. Of course, we need to manage risk and measure risk. Uh, we can't be negligent about these things. Um, we are now in since a while uh, in the process of developing a whole leadership program in the studio. Leadership and mentorship is people uh, within the ecosystem whom we see have a great potential to develop to you know to become the better the best version of themselves and uh, we don't pretend that uh, as, as i said earlier we are entrepreneurs by accident somehow <laughs> by miseducation we, we don't pretend to have all the right tools all the right um, methods to fuel the leadership of, of our whole team we but we have the sensitivity so we are now in the process of deploying uh, a leadership and mentorship program where people become specialists and people become um, uh, mentors on certain subjects, and then they have they gain respect uh, and ownership of a certain area. That gives them also the the ability to within that area uh, play, uh, take risks, innovate, try out try out new ideas. Mm. Um, so I think that you know, as I said. To answer your question, innovation is is the result of a set of conditions, and certain of those conditions are within our hands. Others, we need to ensure that you know our clients or the projects they have um, also match, and and to be sometimes a bit tough and uh, strict and say no, this project we are, we're not the best partner for for you to solve it. Someone else will probably do it better. It's you know. We're not going to match. It, it's so interesting what, what you're what you're discussing here, and obviously that that with innovation, with creativity, with the design, it's an inherently risky profession. It's an inherently risky business, right? And the more you know, designers and artists will often find themselves having problems because you know the creativity or the search or the pursuit of the idea is the kind of the main motive and the main emotional driver. That's why everyone is doing it. But engaging in that pursuit is often a risky, it's often at the risk of other things, for example, money and the business. And there's often, an, it appears that creativity can be at odds or in conflict with some of the more, you know, with money and with economics and what makes sense. How do you guys, how have you managed that financial risk that comes with being creative as a, as a business? How have you protected yourselves? You, t- you, you point there at several interesting situations, I would say, that we face day in, day out. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes uh, you might put, you know, at risk the financials of your client, you know, uh, by overspending. By, um, and I think that here that's something that for us is yet another condition that needs to be discussed very openly. What are the means at disposal? I think that this crazy amount of creativity that can come out of economy of means, of scarcity of means, right? And uh, and I think we we absolutely practice we don't practice this enough in this world. Mm. If we did, I think that uh, you know, you know, the whole sustainability conversation would be somewhere else by now, and the whole circularity in design would be somewhere else. If if we appreciated that doing, you know, coming up with clever ideas with limited resources is is double creative, <laughs> if you want. If we started to appreciate that, I think that we would be probably reinventing quite a few things in the design uh, and creative industry. Then there is the, you know, the, the risk within inherent to creative company that uh, if your teams go you know on a tangent for too long then uh, and they don't you know they don't hit uh, something solid you'll be you know your resources you're you're depleting your resources that that costs time costs money and uh, there's a risk there so i think here there are several things that we have put in place one is uh, an agile methodology where we try to you know, do small loops, small iterations in our design process. Uh, we have we run two weeks um, design sprints constantly. So uh, the, all the projects in in the in the studio go through this two week um, 
design um, sprint cycles. So there's only so much you can risk in two weeks. There's only so many bad decisions you can make in two weeks before you kind of confront these ideas with a reality, with a client check or with a, a second opinion. So I think that that, that certainly helps um, uh, make, you know, micro excursions. And I think that you know, micro excursions are good because when you try something and the feedback is positive and feedback is super important in this, uh, you know, that's often disregarded. We talk a lot of people, this, this hype about agile, agile, agile. Uh, agile is nothing without a safe and healthy feedback culture. Right. That's that's what makes the it feels and gives you the push to the next loop. Yeah. So I think that that's something that we've put in place and that helps us a lot um, to give space for creativity and exploration and experiments. But then every two weeks we know we've got a, a little bit of a checkpoint. And the other aspect is um, involving our clients heavily in this design process. So that user-centric co-design approach, because also they will they will be your reality check. Mm. Uh, when I say clients, it's sometimes employees of our clients or sometimes clients of our clients, you know, the market giving us feedback, quick feedback, so that we are not uh, going totally off track. Um, so we need to have yeah, mechanisms that keep us, um, you know, of in line still allowing us to make you know those excursions that way you know when we go on a tangent before we realize it's too late we have had that that little conversation to make it meaningful brilliant and i suppose the other part of this as well is that on one aspect of it on a, on a shallow interpretation of how someone might come across the business, it might seem like, oh, well, these guys do everything. You know, there's there's kind of, you know, as I was saying, it's the niche with no niche, right? But you're not, you're not, you're not generalists. You haven't fallen into that kind of, you know, the mistake that perhaps many designers or architects make, where they're doing a bit of everything and then it becomes bland. There's something here which is a niche that's not kind of defined as such. Mm. How would you? describe that or how would you how do you again how do you maintain not kind of focusing on one particular type of sector that's a million dollar do uh, question <laughs> <laughs> um we don't do everything um and uh, the proof is that we reject projects right and, uh, normally we don't reject them uh because you know Mm, we're too busy uh, or because uh, we don't like someone. I mean, mm. normally we reject them, A, because there is that transformation aspect that I mentioned at the very beginning is not there. Yeah. Uh, if a project is, you know, for lack of better words, cosmetic, right. just, you know, sugar coating something, but with not no transformational <laughs> ambition, we, we, you know, we try to find out through conversation with the client. But if there's not that component, that's not interesting for us. We I mean we're not saying we're not being judgmental. It might be interesting for someone else. We're just not the right people for that, for that challenge. Um, also, sometimes uh, it comes down to, you know, we talk, uh, there's a lot of talk about B2B, B2C. At the end, doing business is P2P. It's yeah. person to person. There's personal chemistry. And that, that personal chemistry has to do with empathy, with sympathy, with trust. And uh, over the years, we have also developed uh, a bit of an intuition about this. What we have in front of us, uh, a person, a group of people, mm. you also need to feel connected you also need to feel that uh, yeah you you see the world from compatible perspectives i'm not going to say the same perspective but compatible perspectives mm. and that there will be respect throughout and we try to be you know as transparent as possible from the beginning about the things that we will go through about the engagement that we expect from the clients 
And uh, sometimes, you know, clients say, whoa, 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 that's too much. You know, you're, you're asking me to, to really commit to this, but, you know, we're expecting you to come up with all of this. Again, that's for us a way of saying uh, we're not the people you're looking for. So I think that there are several, you know, uh, key, key questions there that we, we ask um, and that lead us to think, well, this project, we're not the right people. And, um, and I think that there's also this, what we call the, the vantage point model. It's imagine a mountain and a mountain mm -hmm. where at the very top, uh, you know, where there's snow, that's the philosophy layer. <clears throat> and then there's the culture layer. And then somewhere down comes the strategy layer, the tactics, uh, the policies, and at the end, the tasks. We like projects where, you know, you touch the whole mountain. Mm. We don't like just coming and talking about the philosophy of our client and, you know, doing a bit of strategy work and then you know, leaving them halfway down the mountain. And we also don't, don't like when we jump into a project and someone says, well, this is the whole strategy and these are the tactics and you just need to deploy now, you know, the, the create outputs. We believe that we won't be the right person, the right the right partner. So we like projects where this whole spectrum of conversations can happen, where we can talk about philosophy, about um, the, the culture of, of an organization, about the strategies, even tweak some of the strategies, have an influence there, at least have a deep understanding of those strategies, and then sort of work our way down into the deployment. So strategy all the way down to uh, deployment and um, yeah so we have certain criteria like this that um, um, that help us uh, make decisions about about projects brilliant uh, brilliant I, I think that's the I mean that's so so interesting and I think it's probably the, the perfect place for us to conclude our conversation I've got lots of other things I'd like to to ask you but I think we might have to do another another conversation at a later date but um Key thank you so much for uh, giving us a glimpse inside the workings of Studio Banana and, and and its inception. And I think what you guys are doing is really, really inspirational and a, and a kind of, it's, it's the it's one of these businesses that I, I know a lot of designers are, would be envious about because it's so, you know, you, the, the the diversity and the richness, but also the the coherency of what it is that you're doing kind of it makes sense. And it's, yeah, it's wonderful. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Ryan. It's been a great pleasure being there part of this conversation with you and uh, happy to continue with you or with anyone in the audience who wants to reach out. Uh, I'm always happy to strike a good conversation. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ryan. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.